I know I believe some crazy stuff back in the day. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I believe that you had to make money, you had to sell crack cocaine, and that's how I became a, dr a drug dealer. You know? Really? Wow. You didn't know that about me? <laughs> yeah. No. That's all in my past, my story. Yeah, this, this guy brought it up, and I was like, and wow. God was like, yeah, you remember how far you came? I was like, yeah, I came pretty far. But that's, I, when I was in, so when I was, uh, I thought you knew about that. So when I was, you better study up on who you follow now. I a little joke here. I better, I, better, I better do a little research. So when I was 15, I was, I, used to, I, I was always an entrepreneur. And I tell people that I didn't always sell, you know, stuff that was kosher. But I was, I was always into selling. Back then, I didn't care anything about but making money. And uh, I was very uh, egotistical and very, um, you know, I was just an angry kid, basically. Um, I grew up believing that I was worthless. I was no good. I was an accident. I was actually told that, that, you know, you, you were an accident. We didn't, we really didn't mean to have you. <laughs> Stuff like that. And so, and, and again, forgiveness. Why? Because at a, at, at a certain point you realize, and this is what uh, deep stuff that Hawkins teaches, you realize that there is nothing to forgive. Dude, that's a whole new level. And, and that, that, that's why I don't teach that, really. Yeah, yeah. But so, so the, the first level is you forgive everyone for everything they've done. Okay, that's, that's the initial level of forgiveness. The acid test of forgiveness, as Joseph Murphy says, is when somebody tells you about that individual and uh, like, hey, they're doing great. I heard they just got a new job and they got a brand new Mercedes that how do you feel about that person when they tell you that that's the acid test of forgiveness did you really forgive now if you're happy for that person you don't want them back in your life again probably but if you're ha genuinely happy for that person like wow that's great I'm glad that th things are going up for that person then you've really forgiven them if you're you're like ah, 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 then you it's, it's an acid test um, so so forgiveness forgiveness is really for me right it's not for the other person we know that um, because to not forgive is like taking, you know, a, you know, a, a piece of rotten meat or a piece of meat and just putting it in the attic. Well, I know what's going to happen to it in a month if I don't check on it or whatever. And I put that in my heart and it's just going to rot and fester and affect me, not the other person. They're living, enjoying their life, whatever they're doing. So that's the first level of forgiveness. But the second level of forgiveness, when you start to read letting go and you start to internalize all that stuff, it takes, it takes some time. Some people, it, it's very quickly. But eventually you realize the paradigm shift is that there's nothing to forgive because everything happened for a purpose. And think about this for a minute. What if I actually picked my mom and dad? What if, what if I was like, wait, wait, wait a minute, God, send me into that family because I want to experience that, you know? You see what I'm saying? So now... People could say, well, there's no way I picked my family. Well, if you don't believe that, maybe you believe God picked them for you. So you're saying you would have made a better choice than God made? Either way, it, it, it's kind of a hard thing to, to, to deal with. So since, since I chose that, or for whatever reason God did, and if I knew the reasons behind why he chose it, I wouldn't have changed it. Then there's really nothing to forgive because everything played out the way that it is supposed to. This goes way out there, but the, one, the way one guy put it, he says, um, let's say, you know, we were all in, you, you and I were in heaven, and you, we were like, uh, hey, I want to I wanna understand how, what betrayal feels like. And God says, well, okay, well, I'll send you to the earth for a season, 80 years, whatever, and, uh, and I'll let you experience that. And then my friend next to me says, are you, say, hey, but can I be the betrayer? It's like, yeah, yeah, you can go. And then we come down here together. We both have a role. That's a whole different paradigm shift. I don't know that that's the way it happens. I'm just saying that when you get to a point where you realize everything happened the way it should have, as bad as it can be. And I, I know there's some really, really, when you get into pedophiles and all this, that I, I already feel those people should be wiped off the earth. They should be sentenced to death and whatever. Regardless of that, um, at some level, you know, you get to a point, and I'm I'm there, where I realize that there there is there is nothing to forgive because the person was doing the best that they could with the information they had. You know what I'm saying? And so, like my mom and dad did the best they could with what the ignorance that they, you know, had. You know? 
So at that time, when I was 15, I started selling drugs in school and I, and I was selling marijuana. And back then, this, this friend of ours, uh, he was 15 also. We went to the uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Did you ever you heard of that movie? So we went to the high school that that movie was filmed at, Verdugo Hills in California. We call it Verdrugo because, anyway, it, so this guy would go, his, his, uh, his brother sold weed, and he would have a trash can full of weed. And so what he would do is he would get a bread bag, like a Wonder Bread type bag, and he would fill it up. We'd say, man, uh, uh, Tim, go fill it. What, I don't remember his name, but Tim, go fill this up about that much, and we'll give you 20 bucks. And he would go do it. So he would take the weed out, and then he would smooth it over so his brother couldn't see that he had taken any, and then we would pay him. And then what I would do is I would roll, I figured out that you could roll joints and make more money than selling them by tens. So I'd roll joints and I'd go to school every day with 30 joints. And I'd tell them for a dollar a joint. <laughs> well, it so happened that one of the kids in school was a narc. We didn't know, but he was an undercover narc. And so one day I got a, uh, and I had sold to him like four times. And so one time I got a pink slip to go to the principal's office and we, I went and they said, J.D. Nolly Williams. And they put me up against the wall. That means juvenile delinquent. And it was this kid in a uniform. I was like, what? You know, he looked like a kid, but he was a police officer. And so I went to juvenile hall. I mean, he looked really young. Uh, and I was in school. I was, I was in that juvie for six weeks awaiting trial. And so I had four felonies, basically, at that point. Selling to a police officer, you know. Wow. So when I got out, but when I was in juvenile hall, one of the kids, his name is Bam, who was in there, he was like, man, you're selling joints for a dollar. I'm selling rocks for 25 bucks each a gram. I was like, well, what's that look like? So he picked up a rock off the yard. He showed it to me. He said, I could sell that for 25. I said, 25 bucks? And I'm spending, I'm rolling all these joints. All these <laughs> I could sell that for 25. He's like, yeah, you get out. I'll hook you up. Just ask for so-and-so. So here it was, I got out, and then I had another buddy I met in there, he taught me how to rob, you know, houses. So I became a thief wow. <laughs> and a dope dealer. Okay. Learned that and then, and, 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 I mean, I was, it was bad, it was real bad. But then, that, then you know, Jesus got a hold of me when I was 18, and that's when everything changed, you know, everything changed. But I, I, was, on a, I was on a whole different, you know, my best friend went to jail for attempted murder. My buddy, who was teaching me the game, he got locked up for life behind because he was on parole and he was selling. We, we got there was a raid on the projects where we were selling. He got caught, and then uh, another buddy of mine, I mean, attempted this one that I just talked to. He 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 went to jail for murder and got out, you know, because it was self defense. But um, that was my life. That was supposed to be my experience, and but. God had other plans, you know, for me. I know. Look, we're sitting here. We're hanging out. <laughs>